Carla. Uh -huh. Primera de Guada, a tope. Joder, ¿cómo le pasa eso? <risa> Cuadro. Ok, so let's begin. What what was that brought you here to Baltic? Oof. It it is the unavoidable place to be in when you were at my age at that time. You know, so I knew it way before I started getting involved about the festival, the catalog and so on. It was the people, the friends, the environment and this detachment that we were able to have from living in a city. Although it had a lot of energy and we enjoyed it, but this place was near paradise for us. You know, friends are warmer friends. Time is imbued with dry, healthy weather. And you just thought you were out of reality when you were here. And this is Balbek for everybody. It is some realization of a kind of ideal vision that we think, ah, oh, if I can live like that all my life, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and before the war, Lebanon was, was known as the Pearl of the Mediterranean. What was, what was Lebanon like before the war? Oh, before the war, it is the country where I lived since I was eight years old. You know that. And uh, we spent our childhood at schools here. And we were imbued totally with a kind of atmosphere that is very privileged, very privileged, namely an atmosphere that is not known at the time to the inland of the Arab world. I'm talking inland far, like where my father came. Okay, it's a beautiful country, it's a whatever it is, but it was still a country far from reaching reconciliation with itself to open up to the world. Uh, it was a country in progress of uh, independence and self-assertion like all countries in the region. But the qualities that we lived in here, especially at boarding schools, and we were at a missionary boarding school in Su'ul Gharb. Um, it is a place where you grew up <coughs> with children of your age, multi-factional, multi-religious, multi-whatever it is, and you never, never, never thought at any one moment of the differences that made you coexist rather than that living together in this variety was the natural thing. And as we grew older in reality, we thought, I think at least, that this is richness of diversity that is in the Orient that is currently very mal abused uh, is the richness of civilization. It is the strata over strata over strata of history and it coexisted well together all the time. Until, of course, we struck it rich and we started having things that everybody wanted. So, this is 
the Lebanon that I was parachuted into as a child. And it stayed with me until I left. But the first time I realized the importance or the necessity of identity of a sort was when I failed my second year, uh, you know, uh, secondary school because I had skipped a class. So my parents wisely decided to bring me to Beirut to attend day college with an American, very modern background and so on. And we were sitting at the registrar waiting to write our applications. In the application, there was your name, father's name, uh, mother's name, which I knew all, nationality, Iraqi. I was Iraqi, now I'm Lebanese. So I'm Lebanese and Iraqi and Syrian born. So I am what you could call trans-Arab. Now, I came to a question on the form which was I never encountered in my life, religion. Personally, I know who I belong to and what kind of religion, what kind of family, what kind of tradition, but that was never a question asked to me by another person, religion. Then, sect, not sex, sect. I went red in the ears, you know, I didn't know. Sunni, Shia, so I struck both of them. I was 13 or four, 13 at the time. So my younger brother was with me and uh, he did exactly the same. We went to meet the registrar. A gentleman with eyeglasses, big fat fellow, who looked at it and read it and said, what are you being a communist now at your age? I didn't know what a communist was, you know? So to tell you, and where our answer back was, we as Iraqis, we don't identify religion as a difference. He had to talk to my father on the phone at the consular embassy, and my father had to give him a dressing and a lesson and threatening all sorts of threats about cutting off scholarships to the college and so on. And then we got a registrar who said, no, 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 sir, we didn't mean it. We have no intentions. It's only for statistical reasons. But my parents who are as me, really, they are trans-Arabs. You know, they don't, uh, and trans-religion, their friends are from all over the map. Our friends are from all over the map. We never had this. This was Lebanon. Lebanon was that. So. Do you believe that um, what made uh, and makes Lebanon different from the countries that surround it is its people? Not really. The mix is there all over. The mix is in Iraq, the mix is in Syria, the mix is in Egypt and everybody coexisted creatively during a period which was post-independences. That's the period we're talking about in the, uh, that you, I, you're documenting in this film, that first period. It's post-independences where people were very optimistic to the future. People had a drive of learning and challenging existing uh, uh, sort of uh, dogmatic rules and uh, I know from my my parents I and mean, it's very simple they are older they are from an older generation my father uh, 
is a, was a diplomat functionary of a government that is of extreme right. But first time I saw my father cry is when, let's say, Syria and Egypt split their union. It's a paradox. A man working against the union because of government rule, then when it really happens, he breaks down. You know, <laughs> it's, this, is, this is, you know, to tell you that our generation really came with a baggage of positive attitude to life and what makes life. You know, what we entered now is a mix, great mix of political ambitions here, political ambitions there, uh, minimum kind of uh, attachment to civilization by some communities and they become automatically dependent, these communities, militarily, economically, administratively, etc. And now we are in a state where the most retarded states on human rights, on uh, cultural history, are really guiding the, the time now, along with the big powers. And what was the, the cultural scene back then like? Wow. It was, you know, how a human heart pulses all the time and you know you are alive. It was like that. It was pulsing, throbbing in every aspect. No, I'm not talking about Lebanon only. I'm talking all the way to Basra in Baghdad, uh, south of Iraq talking to Egypt, you had first in publishing, you had in poetry, in folk poetry, in art, in, in, in 58, 60 meters of monument was commissioned to a great sculptor, Jawad Salim in Baghdad, on the merits of you know, a dictator doesn't know anything about art, but he knows this is an Iraqi great sculptor. And still now, it's a record in, even in, in uh, execution. Within two years, the thing was completed, still standing, and whatever they tried to do to ruin it in Iraq, still standing. The, we had a life that Lebanon always re focused and reflected. You know, you put a lens on the sun ray and it focuses it to create fire. Uh, that, is the, that was Lebanon. Everything happened here, Beirut. But we knew about what was happening and we propagated it and we assimilated it in our communal uh, feeling. We are people of the East. We are not a Lebanese only, or a Syrian only, or an Iraqi only. We are another culture that uh, the Western culture sort of looked at it through a microscope. So we had the Orientalist attitude of studying us, patronizing us, I don't know what us, but in essence, they were studying our weaknesses. And what you are seeing now is the result of that. They know more where we never really paid attention to reading this, what was, what was happening. Also, what, e what events do you recall from that period before the war? <laughs> it was like one of my great friends, a poet, says, you only rem remember happiness. I mean, events that happiness charged our thought. You know, you could improvise before the war. Improvise. 
I mean, I I was I was between doing painting, between doing uh, design, between whatever I ambivalent atmosphere still, and I had an, a job in Kuwait for a short time in graphic uh, design, and I came to Lebanon because I couldn't live outside Beirut. And I took back my job as a designer in a Nahar newspaper. Why? Because it was the uh, mind-liberated community of writers and poets, Unsi Hajj, Hissam Mahfouz, Riyad Reyes, I don't know what, Ghassan Twaini, all these people, and we felt in Ras Beirut, in our kingdom, in our place that is, was inimitable elsewhere, inimitable. You know, our cafes were inimitable, our friends and friendship relationships were unique. And one of these days, one of my friends says, what can we do to go to the, the project to do for the Gulf? I said, he had a desk diary in front of him on the desk. I said, this is the economist diary. Let's do something similar in a bilingual, in Arabic, different cover, different story in the beginning, and for the Gulf. And it was a breakthrough. And we did it, and boy, it worked. When I came back from Kuwait, we were, you know, doing good business, but I didn't, my mind is never in business. So I was walking down the street in Hamra from An Nahar, and I find an old man that uh, intercepts me in the street. Says, hey, Mr. Paris, long time no see. And I recognized him. He was a real estate spotter uh, who had once found me a studio in Beirut, which I had left then. He said, Do you need anything now? And you know, that moment in 19, it's around October, November 71, just like this, in the street, in the middle of Hamra. I said, yeah, I'm looking for a place, ground floor, off Hamra, uh, 100 meters to use as an office or a space to show things. And I didn't have that thought. It's because that man asked me. He said, yeah, how much do I, I said, as usual, one month. He said, okay, come with me. So we cross the street, he gets the keys and opens to me a space that for me was enough as a gallery. Full stop, I had decided. I said, I'm taking it. I called one of my childhood friends, I said, Cesar, I found a place, I want to do a gallery, how about we're working together? Bam, contact art gallery started. And I tell you, a period of Lebanese art history started or took, took speed then into another gear when we opened our gallery. But this is Beirut. I mean, you could improvise and succeed and go somewhere. Also, other than painting, design, and being a gallerist, you have, there's always been a constant in your life that is photography. How did it begin, and, and what made you want to portray this? It, it wasn't a, a dis decision. It wasn't a decision, perhaps. It was... Uh, I had my first camera, like uh, all fathers, my father, at the age of 11 or something, 12, gave me one of these soapbox cameras. And I took a couple of pictures, as usual, it's family, and that was my grandmother. And now, looking at the print of it now, I'm surprised. I can't claim knowledge of photography. But I, I did good photographs for the family. 
So in my second degree, which is three years after, he gave me a Kodak bellows. And at that same time, I started photographing more. But one of my friends, my childhood friend, had a Zeiss icon because uh, he could afford it. And I used to borrow it from him to photograph. We used to go photographing together. Then by the time, by 1969, I was, till 1969, I was doing it on the side of the many things I did at the time until I was asked to do the poster and the catalog for Jaita uh, second concert by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. And I knew that they are also inviting Max Ernst and a group, André Masson, and all friends of Stockhausen to the... And I decided it's about time that I had my own camera because I wanted to do a, a portfolio on Max Ernst, who was for me one of the idols of the of 20th century painting. And I bought a camera, a Nikon F2S, <laughs> or something like that. And I did my first serious portfolio on Max Ernst. And then, you know, photography is a bit like a smoking or a drink or a drug or it, it, you can't leave it. Then it's stuck all the time here. Now I, I, I take it a bit easy, but that was it. I enjoyed snapping moments. I didn't see all my, my, what I photographed because I did a lot and I was busy doing something else. It might be acting, it might be, I don't know what, uh, my work, it might be laziness, but an archive accumulated. <laughs> so, that's, What's with photography? It's, uh, it's not a profession. I've never, till very recently, sold a photograph. But I enjoyed and to ecstasy shooting rare moments. Now being back here in, in Baalbek, what memories does it evoke? Oh. Sad thing is sometimes memories uh, get associated to nostalgia. And I don't like nostalgia because I like being creative at the moment. You know, that bringing back nostalgia is very, very uh, weakening. And I don't like to be weak. I prefer to enjoy Baalbek with the new friends, or the friends of now, with what it can mean to me now, than just be locked in a moment in time. Also, here, if you can tell us something that you remember from this specific house as wow. you, know, you portrayed. <laughs> this specific house is like the emotional womb for us when we came to Baalbek. We came to, to feel where we could have been eternal. You know, it's very strange. Uh, you have encountered, let's say, uh, uh, the owners of the house have encountered them. Now, we don't see each other. There were periods we didn't see each other for more than 10 years. But when you step in here, you are in your, your private world. It's very strange. 
يعني I knew and that's always the feeling it's your private world your private paradisiac place this is I knew this place I knew the father I knew the mother I knew the sisters I knew I knew every I knew their children I knew uh, it's it's a place that you you know it's like my family I know them more than my family in Syria and Iraq <laughs> especially in Iraq I don't know anybody practically okay so this is it but Uh, you're most welcome, my friend. <laughs> Let's pack and go.